Good afternoon, everyone. Namaste. I'm going to do a talk, a short talk that I uh, was originally an article that I wrote some many years ago. It's called Universality. The ideal of universality is one of the most essential teachings that we should be trying to get across to our brothers and sisters in society. It is the promulgation of the fact that all religions, philosophies and processes of thought that have any real value in them are striving towards the same end. Names, concepts and, and uh, rituals have ultimately no permanency. To merge our finite minds into the universal mind is surely worth our most concentrated efforts. The truth is that we are circumscribed by our failure to grasp the potential that lies within us and by the limitations that we create as a result of our identification with the transient personality, which in reality is just a mirage. Our physical body needs food and drink, sexual intercourse, etc., to bring it into existence and to keep it going. But our lower minds turn these basic necessities into evils, in inverted commas. We make of them a kind of fetish and endow them with qualities that they should not possess. This overindulgence leads to many serious problems, physical, mental and moral. It also shuts out the true spiritual light that can heal, it can heal all our, all our illnesses on whatever plane they may manifest. It is a wonder indeed to develop in ourselves the ability to recognise the divinity in another human being. We degrade one another as a result of our failure to see the one self in all and in everything. Our free love, as, as, as many people talk about nowadays, is certainly not liberation, although it is nowadays regarded as such. We are forced to ask the question, liberated from what? Modern education fails to prevent us from seeing the baseness in another, but in fact it should be teaching us to see the goodness, the divinity, which is far more prevalent if we scratch the surface. This is what H.P. Blavatsky means when she writes concerning theosophical education. We should aim at creating free men and women, free intellectually, free morally, unprejudiced in all respects, and above all things, unselfish. Which is in the key to theosophy, page 268. There is certainly a regenerative power in being able to recognise the higher aspects of another human being and of mankind in general, and of all our fellow creatures. Wars and strifes would fall away if only we would cease erecting barriers and giving the weeds of fear and hatred well-fertilised soil in which to grow. The task is not beyond us. It is simpler than we think or are willing to admit. The mistakes of modern civilization have provided destructive forces with just the right conditions to flourish. Modern trends which lead towards the trivialization of human relationships are the natural offspring of these same destructive forces. Flabby thoughts and actions which society encourages can be of no avail in the struggle to win back our divine birthright. No wonder the voice of the silence dwells long upon this problem. In fragment one of the Voice of the Silence, we are told the following. Behold the hosts of souls. Watch how they hover over the stormy sea of human life, and how exhausted, bleeding, broken-winged, they drop one after another on the swelling waves. Tossed by the fierce winds, chased by the gale, they drift into the eddies and dis disappear within the first great vortex. And in even more plaintive tones, the voice of the silence also tells us, alas, alas, that all men should possess a liar, the one with a great soul, and that possessing it, a liar, should so little avail them. 
Behold how like the moon, reflected in the tranquil waves, a liar is reflected by the small and by the great, is mirrored in the tiniest atom, yet fails to reach the heart of all. Alas, that so few men should profit by the gift, the priceless boon of learning truth, the right perception of existing things, the knowledge of the non-existent. We are told also throughout the book that we should be constantly striving to give up the life of the physical personality and the sense of separateness, which, they, which is said to be a great dire heresy. Certainly, alas, is the right word to use in such a context. The dictionary defines the word as one that expresses pity, grief, etc. Are students of theosophy really able to grasp the significance of the above quotations from the voice of the silence and many others of equal significance in that and other books? The fact that so many people can go through their lives as mere slaves to the physical at the same time believing that they are fulfilling the purpose of their existence is certainly sad. It is like owning an expensive and complex computer and only learning how to turn it on and then going no further. The human being has infinitely more potential than a machine and has a chance to realise that which will make of him or her a god or goddess. There is no megalomania in this as true understanding will bring to a, us a, a realisation of our oneness with everything else. Human solidarity is something that, once grasped, will initiate tremendous changes in the consciousness of humanity and alter its psychological makeup. If we merely cling to concepts, even theosophical ones, without putting them into practice, there's a division between ourselves and others that prevents us from relating in fullness to them. The great Buddhist patriarch Bodhidharma is reputed to, reputed to have said, you will not find Buddha in images or books. Look into your own heart. That is where you will find Buddha. This is also expressed in the voice of the silence, in the words, look inward, thou art Buddha. Gautama Buddha himself was always keen to impress on the minds of his disciples that they should not attach themselves to any set ideas. The Mahayana classic, the Diamond Sutra, is an excellent treatise on this and is well worth a perusal by the interested student. The whole subject of universality is a simple one to grasp, but difficult to put into practice. HPB in her writings refers to some of those who may be regarded as true theosophists in the wider sense of the word. She mentions Father Damien, who went to live among the lepers in Molokai and eventually died of the disease himself. She also gives credit where credit is due to writers and poets like Dickens and Thackeray, Shelley and Tennyson, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. All these in some way transcended the conventions of their environment and touched the truly human side of their nature. There are many others who have managed to forget themselves in their attempts to help others, which is true altruism. Such people have all fulfilled the requirements that make a theosophist as defined by as defined by H. P. Blavatsky in an article, Practical Occultism, where she says, it is easy to become a theosophist. Any person of average intellectual capacities and a leaning towards the metaphysical of a pure unselfish life who finds more joy in helping his neighbour than in receiving help himself, one who is ever ready to sacrifice his own pleasures for the sake of others, of other people, and who loves truth, goodness and wisdom for their own sake, not for the benefit they may confer is a theosophist. So this is all well and good, but allows for a wide margin of belief. To become an occultist is a different matter altogether. 
one must be a well, the one must be a theosophist before one can become an occultist. One who goes deeper into the mysteries of nature must possess the knowledge born of deep study and meditation on life's hidden secrets. However, there is that feeling in the heart of mankind of an innate oneness with something that defies all description, and yet it's nearer to us than anything else in the whole universe, and in fact is that very universe itself. It is this that raises man or woman, and it transcends any conceptualised thought. Certain individuals, despite their dogmatic upbringing, have succeeded in communing with this divine essence. And it is these that H. P. Blavatsky singles out for commendation. Certain people may point out that some of, the, of those mentioned by H. P. Blavatsky were not exactly renowned for their virtuous lifestyles. The answer to this problem lies in the fact that we should never judge by appearances and that a tree is known by its fruits. Morality does not lie in solely in refraining from sexuality. There are deeper and more important dimensions to it all. Remember, we must draw the line between a theosophist and an occultist. The latter follows a much more strenuous path and his training necessitates the strictest chastity of body, speech and mind. A theosophist must be pure in heart, but this may not be all that evident in his day-to-day -day life. In the words of a master of wisdom, remain rather as indifferent to the abuse as to the praise of those who could, could never know you as you really are, and who ought therefore to find you unmoved by either, and ever placing the approval or condemnation of your own inner self higher than that of the multitudes. What the above quotation implies is that we should never judge anyone without being fully conversant of the facts. No doubt there are individuals who are flagrantly immoral and therefore need to be told of the degrading effects of their actions on themselves and on others. Whether they choose to follow the advice given is a matter for their own conscience and a blatant continuation of their practices to the detriment of society may lead to restraining actions being taken. In a civilised society, punishment will be out of the question. Karma will balance the scales. But we should, we should ensure the safety of others by restraining the culprit and at least attempting to re-educate them. There are, however, other classes of people who are constantly struggling against their lower natures and who, owing to karma and their environment, are often not succeeding. They're torn between two worlds, but their higher self is constantly urging them on to better things. They may become the saints of another life, and their struggles will give them invaluable experience for the future. It is important to understand this strange quirk of human nature. If we can look deeper than the surface, we might find that one who lives a virtuous life outwardly may have very little inner light, whereas an outwardly controversial person may be much more illuminated. Such an attitude is one of strict universality. We should try to see beyond the veils and make an attempt to find the divinity in others. This simple practice will quickly dissolve the mists that prevent us from seeing our brothers and sisters in their true light. H.P. Blavatsky told us that fear and hatred are essentially the one, one and the same. He who fears nothing will never hate, and he who hates nothing will never fear. If we recognise in another's the very same divinity that dwells within each one of us, then how can we hate? It is only the illusion of separateness that casts a glamour over our lower minds and forces us to imagine all kinds of erroneous things regarding our fellow human beings. We strive to defend ourselves, our family, our country, against outsiders. And we should be realising that there are no outsiders or even insiders. There's only one divinity pulsating in every atom in this vast universe. It's a sad fact that some people are actually thinking in terms 
of preparing against attacks from inhabitants of other planets. However, there are many movements towards world peace, and there's every reason to be optimistic for the future. Equally, equally we must never be complacent, but be constantly striving to awaken the spirit of universality in our own hearts and in the hearts of our brothers and sisters of whatever nationality. Thank you very much for listening. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace. Peace on earth and goodwill to all beings.